Okay. This is a little bonus video where I discuss the method of two-party preferred voting. This is the method used to elect candidates to the House of Representatives in the Australian Federal Parliament. And I just want to relate the method to the concepts of social choice theory so you can see how it fits in to that bigger picture. So under two-party preferred voting, let's say we have three candidates, candidates A, B, and C. Three candidates, candidates A, B, and C. And each, ele each uh, elector, each member of the electorate, has to number their ballot paper one to three, assigning those numbers to the three candidates. So let's say we have one, two, three. Another person, one, two, three. We also have one, two, three, one, three, two, one, three, two. And then candidate B will get a couple of primary votes as well. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, suppose that was uh, our election so far. And that's, that's the entire extent of the electorate. Then, what would we expect? Uh, how, how do you apply the method? The method then says you count the number one votes only for each candidate and tally them up. So A has three of these number one votes, first preferences. B also has three. And candidate C has two. And what you do for after, after this is, because it's two-party preferred voting, you throw out everyone except the f first two place getters. Here, the first two place getters are tied, but even if there was a big difference between them, as long as they're first and second in the number of number one votes, they stay in, and you just redistribute the votes awarded as number one votes to, to a third candidate, to the, the additional candidates. So these two votes would be re-examined. These ones are now all locked in and won't be looked at again. And so candidate C now uh, is not in the running, so we ignore these one votes, and we look, what's the next preference that was given? In this case, both the next preferences were given to candidate B, so those are added. So now, having taken extra preferences into account, candidate A stays on three, but candidate B goes to five, and so candidate B is declared the winner. Notice, this voting method is really only designed to pick a single winner. So using the concepts we had before of a collective choice rule or a social welfare function, this is a collective choice rule. Why? Because it's really only intended to pick one outcome from our original list of options as the, the elected one. That said, it wouldn't be terribly hard, you can see, to construct a ranking of these options. You rank them by, first and foremost, their um, you, you rank these two, the first two, based upon the distributed votes. So we would say this was number one. This one comes number two. And then among all the others, and remember I've got only one, a third candidate here, but there could be many others. You just rank them on the basis of their primary votes, their, their first preferences. And so this would be number three. So in the neighborhood, there is a social welfare function. Now, question for you. If that's the method, Kenneth Arrow's famous proof, the, his impossibility theorem about social choice, is that um, sets up this ideal that a social welfare function should meet various conditions. Conditions like unanimity, universal domain, independence of irrelevant alternatives. I won't write that out, it's too long. Transitivity. And there should be no dictators in the sense of single people who can determine the social ranking even though everybody is voting in the opposite direction. Do you think the two-party preferred method of voting violates one or more of these desirable conditions? Well, perhaps that question is a bit too easy because if you know what Arrow's proof is, 
He's saying it is impossible to satisfy all of these. So given it's impossible, it must, must violate at least one. But the question is, which do you think it is likely to violate? I'll leave you to think about that on your own.